Well, hello and welcome to another fully vaccinated and socially distanced in the faculty lounge. I'm Paul Hauptman, Dean of the Graduate School of Medicine, and I'm joined today by Dr. Heath Maney from the Department of Surgery here at the University of Tennessee Medical Center. Welcome, Heath. Good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, what we often do in the faculty lounge is to uh, start at the beginning. And uh, what I took note of is that you went to the University of Tennessee here in Knoxville as an undergraduate, and then the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis for your medical degree, followed by a surgical residency at the University of New Mexico, and, uh, and then went to practice. And uh, after a number of years, you ended up doing a critical care fellowship here uh, at the UT Medical Center. But then your career took a, a different turn, mm -hmm. and that's what we're going to focus on quite a bit today. But maybe before we do that, let, let's, let's ask why medicine, why surgery? Um, I think our audience often likes to get personal with uh, our guests. Yeah, uh, I think why surgery uh, was because of just the, uh, I think the, the direct and sort of instant gratification you get in doing an operation for somebody who uh, is a sick patient. Uh, and, you know, the classic operation is uh, an appendectomy for acute appendicitis. And, you know, I still you know, love doing that operation today because of uh, the fact that uh, your patients almost always get better after doing it and you see that happen quickly and, and get to really uh, engage in that in a, in a very technical way. And so, uh, but it's that that interested me in being a surgeon. And tell us a little bit about the decision to do critical care, mm -hmm. and uh, I suspect that really helped you later on, as as we'll get into in just a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I we had um, actually been uh, serving overseas for two years and realized that uh, critical care development needed to occur in the hospital where we were serving, and so came back uh, here to do the critical care fellowship to equip me to be able to do that, to be able to lead that process at the hospital where we were working. So let's talk about that. You decided to go to a hospital in, you said, Western Kenya. Correct. It's called Tenwick Mission Hospital. Correct. Tell us about that decision. And, and also, when you got there, did it uh, meet your expectations? What, what were you expecting? What was it really like? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we, uh, my wife is an OBGYN, and uh, she and I had done uh, a rotation our fourth year in medical school at this same hospital. So this was in 2000. Um, last rotations of our medical school time right before we started our residency and uh, that really planted a seed uh, in hoping uh, that we would go back there at some point in our career to serve. Um, it was just a matter of when and, and uh, as we went through our residency and um, had our two daughters and went into practice, life gets really busy and all of a sudden 10 years has passed and you're asking, okay, when when do we want to do this? And so we were reaching that point in our family stage of life where we either needed to go and do that or wait till retirement age, perhaps when our children were older and ultimately decided to sort of devote that middle portion of our career to being able to, to work overseas. And so it was, it was a long process of discernment, trying to figure out, okay, well, how do we do that? Where do we do that? What's the meaning, most meaningful way to engage in that? Um, but we're ultimately led to this location because of the training opportunities and being able to equip African surgeons to be able to do the work that we were doing. Just seeing that as a way to, uh, again, just be more effective and strategic in our involvement there. So you're raising a number of interesting points. Um, you know, there are a lot of physicians who will go uh, to a foreign country. They'll spend a week there, two weeks there. Uh, ophthalmologic surgery, hand surgery, th things like that, you made a much more serious commitment. You were there for, I believe, six years? Correct, yeah. So, uh, you know, tell us about that decision, but also, um, you know, what you what you found there. You, you had been there as a medical student. Now mm -hmm. you're there as a full-fledged attending surgeon. Mm -hmm. and, and what kind of challenges did you face uh, along the way? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we felt like uh, instead of a short-term trip, a long-term trip would be, again, the most effective way to make a lasting impact in what we were doing and recognizing that we were going to be involved with resident education. We knew there was going to be, there's going to need to be some pretty significant commitment just to allow us to adapt to the culture and to be able to 
uh, help train most effectively uh, and to improve that process of training uh, in the hospital where we were serving. Um, and so that was sort of why we chose to go at a more uh, you know, full commitment, long-term, sort of indefinite time period when we made that transition. So tell us about the hospital, mm -hmm. um, where it fits into the Kenyan health system. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a regional hospital? It is. It's a. Uh, it's considered. A, it's a mission hospital, uh, and Kenya sort of recognizes mission hospitals as sort of a separate entity, uh, apart from either pr a private hospital system or a public hospital system in Kenya. And those are really the three hospital system types in in the country, and uh, our particular hospital really served as a tertiary referral center for the region, even though it wasn't uh, a, a government hospital. Because of the capabilities of the hospital, uh, it allowed us to serve as a tertiary referral center. So what I want to do is just read some of what you were able to accomplish because it's really pretty astonishing. You were the interim head of surgery, the program director of a general surgery residency uh, program, the medical student director. Uh, you became fellow of the College of Surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa. You were a board reviewer for them. You've written a book chapter entitled A Manual for Practitioners in Low Resource Settings and several papers on, on care in rural Kenya. This is a remarkable productivity. Uh, tell us about the training there. So where did the residents come from? They, they were, I assume, at uh, medical schools in Kenya? Um, most were from uh, Kenyan medical schools. Uh, we really tried to expand uh, our recruitment for residents beyond the borders of Kenya. Uh, so that every other year we were taking a resident from uh, East Africa outside of Kenya. Kenya uh, has really come along uh, much more so than other East African countries in developing medical education as opposed to other countries such as South Sudan, uh, Burundi. Uh, and so we also tried to bring in uh, residents from those countries where they have a much harder time accessing graduate medical education with the idea that they would then hopefully go back to those countries and do the same thing they were being trained to do with us. And so mostly Kenyan, but we had a Burundian resident, uh, a resident from South Sudan, a resident from Nigeria. Um, so that was fun. It was fun seeing that that sort of model happen beyond just the borders of Kenya and influencing a, a much bigger area. So here in the United States, the general surgery programs are five years. Is also five years in, in Kenya? It is. There's a couple of different training models for graduate medical education in East Africa. One is a university-based system, which is four years. And then we were what was referred to as collegiate-based, uh, which is a five-year training program. And our program was modeled uh, in the American model, five years, graduate responsibility, uh, very similar uh, in terms of structure to what we do here. So tell us a little bit about the idea of, of low resource setting. Uh, how difficult was it for you to get the resources that you would need to carry out most of your surgeries? You know, I, I think that's one of the good things about general surgery is that it's fairly basic and fairly low tech. And so if you have uh, some sterile instruments uh, and some suture, you can do a lot of stuff with that uh, in the general surgery realm. Uh, and so for those basic things, um, we did, did pretty, pretty well at uh, having what we needed. Some of the more advanced techniques, laparoscopy, um, endoscopy, uh, and some of the sort of nicer luxuries such, such as stapler devices for intestinal anastomosis, those were harder to come by, but there were ways around that. And so, uh, you know, that was sort of one of the um, adaptations that I had to have is sort of change how I do things to be able to do that there and took a little longer a little a little bit more challenge from a surgical standpoint but we're still able to accomplish most of the things we needed to. So did you get contributions from other sources from mm -hmm. industry from uh, uh, donors mm -hmm. to, to purchase some of that equipment? Um, all of that so we tried um, Certainly there are a lot of donations um, that came through visiting uh, physicians who brought uh, you know, various devices. Um, uh, there, we tried to do a lot of the basic things that we needed to uh, just based on hospital revenue from patient uh, care revenue. And um, so we purchased our own sutures uh, and basic equipment needs, but then for those more complicated, more expensive 
devices. Uh, we would sometimes raise funds, sometimes there would be donations, uh, either through industry or private individuals. So it was really uh, a, 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 a complicated system where we were getting multiple sources of uh, these our supplies. So what sort of advice would you give to, to medical students, to residents, uh, surgeons, and other physicians in practice today who have an interest in global health? Um, what should they look for? What kind of commitment do you think is necessary to really make, as you, as you mentioned, a, a, a real impact? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I certainly don't think that you need to commit your, you know, a six-year commitment or a multi-year commitment or necessarily even moving overseas uh, to engage in that. Um, but I, you know, I do recommend uh, really seeking to engage in some long-term relationship with uh, whatever entity you're working with. And that can be a lot of different things. It can be a clinic or, or a hospital, but it can also be an organization, um, you know, any of, a, a training organization for physicians, uh, teaching organization. There, there's a number of ways to engage, um, but making a long-term commitment to trying to do that over a number of years. And I, I think a lot, of, a lot of that is just it takes a long time to learn where we as sort of outsiders engaging in a healthcare process, where we help and where we hurt. Because uh, we can do both, right? We can, we can uh, uh, clearly bring a lot of benefit and a lot of help to a location, but there's also side effects to what we do um, that uh, are unique to each location and you want to try to have a good understanding of, of how uh, you impact that as uh, coming and serving. Maybe you can give an example or two of that. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. I hadn't really thought about that contextually. So mm -hmm. in your experience, um, were there um, surprises, that, things that you didn't encounter either culturally or medically uh, that forced you to change the way you practice? Um, yeah, I think it, it, probably every day. Uh, the <laughs> cultural encounters every day were uh, surprising. Uh, even after being there for six years, I was still learning cultural nuances. I, and there's a, there's a number of ways. I, I think one of the ways that you discover after uh, working in, in a location like this and, and connecting outside resources is that it can be a good thing to connect those outside resources, but we also want to create sustainability at the local level. And how do you how do you balance that correctly is a really hard thing to do. Um, and um, it, on the one hand, you really want hospitals at the local level, you know, being able to create a financial model that allows them to purchase equipment and things to sustain the hospital so that they're not dependent on outside resources. Right. And it can be easy for us, particularly as Americans, to come in and say, look, well, we have the resources, let's, let's, let's put all of that in and we can do, put everything that we can into that and, and grow that. It, but there may, it may be harmful in the long run if uh, there's not local sustainability. And so there's always a balance uh, in figuring that out. And, and again, it's very nuanced to each particular location is the right way to do that. Well, a job very well done, and we're, we're thrilled to have you back here in Knoxville. Maybe they miss you uh, at Tenwick Mission Hospital, so perhaps you'll go back one day. I hope so. Um, we do have a number of other faculty at the Graduate School of Medicine who are very interested in global health and have participated in a variety of um, efforts in that area, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, interviewing a few of them in the future. But until then, thank you for joining us in the Faculty Lounge here at the Graduate School of Medicine.